Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode on the Trinity. If you'd like more episodes on the Trinity, uh, this is just one episode in a mini series of 12 episodes. Go over to our website at theremnantradio.com and you can actually watch the rest of the series there on our website. Well, what do I say? I, I, I was a doubter of the Trinity for a number of years and it was under uh, a man named Francis Schaeffer that beginning to study uh, the biblical evidences, all of a sudden the lights came on. It was as though the windows of heaven opened for me. And that uh, led me to seminary, along with uh, quite a bit in missions. And so uh, both a THM and then a THD. I was a vis visiting scholar at Tyndale House, Cambridge as well. Uh, 18 years in and out of Brazil and then into Portuguese-speaking Africa, Angola, Mozambique, places like that. And uh, for the last 20 years, a little over 20 years, I've been a professor of systematic theology or theological studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. Excellent. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun to be here. Yeah, well, we, we love having you on. Uh, we've done two episodes in the past. They're online on YouTube if you guys want to check it out. The okay. Remnant Radio, you can go watch those, those episodes on the Trinity uh, that we've done. But we wanted to dive deeper into the topic. Uh, we, I, just, I feel like there's very few... Um, uh, consumable uh, doctrines of the Trinity out there where, where mm -hmm. the, the lay person can just grab a hold of it and say, oh man, like I really want to learn about this. There's very academic uh, literature out there. there is. Uh, but but uh, I, I'm excited to dive into this because you, you do a very good job of making those things plain for the average listener. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's one of my passions. And so I love to teach in other parts of the world as well. Well, we, uh, we think maybe we can start out with a little bit from uh, C.S. Lewis and his Narnia, Narnia, Narnia Chronicles. You might remember Prince Caspian, and there you have, there you have Lucy and the others, and they've come back to Narnia after quite a while out. And uh, it's beautiful the way that that uh, C.S. Lewis expresses this. Here's what's, here's what happened. Uh, Lucy wakes up. She hears a stirring in the forest. She goes out alone into the forest, and she's a little bit lost at first. It's at night, and suddenly. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes, with dark trees dancing all around it. And then, oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, and his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the moment of movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion, but Lucy never thought of that. She, stopped, she never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. The great beast rolled over on its side so that Lucy fell, half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into the large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan said, Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. There's a beauty to that. Because it's true of us. God doesn't grow, of course. He's infinite. But we, as we grow in our Christian lives, we understand that this mysterious one who is three persons is infinitely more than we can grasp. In fact, I would say we'll spend all eternity wanting to know more, knowing more and more, Josh, and yet, and yet uh, never understanding all that we thirst for. I mean, it's overwhelming in one sense, but in another, he's infinite. We're finite. So when we've been there 10,000 years, as we sing sometimes, uh, still God is beyond us, and there is always the fascination. So we grow a little bit and see God as bigger and bigger. C.S. Lewis has an interesting prayer, too, and I, I, I love it. He, uh, he says, may it be the real I who speaks, may it be the real thou that I speak to. May it be the real I, may I be authentic as I speak, O oh God, and may it be the real thou that I really understand, maybe not everything, but I understand rightly, the real thou that I speak to. So that's, that's where we're kicking off. 
And I think one thing that, that strikes, strikes me is uh, the parallel with the Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta idea has been copied by many now in terms of languages and all the rest. But perhaps you don't know that it was discovered by Napoleon's soldiers in 1799. And there are three levels of script on that Rosetta Stone. It still sits in the British Museum in London. One is the Egyptian hieroglyphics, which until that point in history for 2,000 years was largely unknown. And so we have a history of Egypt, one of the most ancient cultures of the world, yet, yet the hieroglyphics were, were mystery. No one could understand them. There was also Demotic Egyptian, which was a trade language, which was known at the time of Christ and a little before that. And then there was Classical Greek. It was written by Ptolemy about 200 years before our Savior and uh, taken to the British Museum in 1802. Translated by Jean-Francois Champignon, and it unlocked literally millennia of Egyptian history. And so we have now hieroglyphics. I even had a professor who could read them off the wall fairly easily. Amazing. Well, I, I take it that in some ways, our understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity is like the Rosetta Stone. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity unlocks the truths throughout the scriptures. I see it as the, as the bedrock, really, of even the Old Testament, often under brush and under a lot of dirt. But underneath it all is the idea, the understanding that God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. We'll be looking at that here in a few minutes. But I'd like to suggest three books that you might want to look at, uh, this for your reading. One is Michael Reeves' Delighting in the Trinity. I use that as a kickoff kind of primer for my own courses on the Trinity, uh, published by InterVarsity Press. At that time, he was kind of the university advisor for uh, the Christian student unions of the United Kingdom. Fred Sanders, perhaps the best known writer on the Trinity today, and he writes in an accessible way for us, The Deep Things of God, How the Trinity Changes Everything, second edition, Crossway, 2017. And then one other, which is really a three-volume set, but a half of that vol half of the first volume is on the Trinity. I wrote that, uh, edited by Nathan Holstein and Michael Spiegel, that is Exploring Christian Theology, and that would be volume one, part two, that would be, would be helpful. So as we kick off, our study focuses on the one God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how we see each as persons, divine persons within the scriptures, how that developed in Christian history, and the beautiful implications of Trinitarian doctrine for, for us today. Well, there's much involved in all of this, but perhaps our Lord's high priestly prayer is one of the most telling for how, in knowing our Lord, we we are brought together in a unity uh, as a part of this body of Christ and really indwelled by, by our God in all of this. So Jesus prays in John 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And then he continues on that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's just an extraordinary prayer, first for the disciples, but then for all who come after them, as our Lord made very clear. So that's our prayers we kick off as well, our Savior's prayer for us. That puts us uh, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, learning from the Word of God as we continue on. But as we begin, it's helpful to talk about the existence of God, and why are we even studying this, the Trinity, but even a little more broadly, because we'll be looking at the attributes of God, the names of God, and so forth. Why do we study this at all? What is our motive in wanting to know more about this God? Uh, we live in an information age, and knowledge is money in a lot of ways, isn't it? I mean, you pay to get a master's degree, you pay to get a PhD, a, a doctorate in philosophy or theology, whatever it might be. And so, for many, knowledge of God becomes a, a, a means of, I want to say, manipulation 
a way of uh, pulling Trump on others and showing how smart we are, one thing or another, that we sometimes want to keep God in a little box that we've formed. Rather, if our purpose isn't to love our Lord more, more deeply, and to serve him more fully, then we treat this sovereign God of the universe as a curiosity, a philosophic problem or, or understanding, a concept to be controlled, a thing to be appropriated then for our own ends rather than really for God's glory. So that's where we're headed. And if you're sitting in a class, or maybe you're just sitting alone listening to this, I'd like you to take a few moments to describe your God. Let's suppose that an alien came in from outer space, or someone shows up asking, who or what is this God you, you worship? Uh, knowing nothing about Christianity, they not knowing, how would you describe the God of Christian faith? Your God. And I'll give you a few moments to try to do that. Usually my students come in and they have a list that sound very biblical and all of that, but not communicating very well to some of those who really are on the outside entirely. So describe your God. So describing like a Trinitarian God. Well, I hope a, Trinity to, gets in there yeah, when you yeah. kick off a course. Sometimes people don't even think of Trinity. So To a, to a Western context, it, it, you know, uh, is different than commuting a Trinitarian God to a Eastern context. Well, you're right in some ways. Yeah. 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 So that, that's intense. Yes. Very, very deliberate in the way that you speak about the Trinity. And, and uh, you have to be deliberate both ways, I would assume. But you have to be, I would almost go the extra mile in, yeah. in saying, hey, you know, it's not this. It's this, but it's definitely not that. Mm -hmm. uh, and being very careful with some of those things. Yeah. It will be a, we'll get to that a little, yeah, absolutely, a little bit later. Absolutely, but, absolutely, yeah. but perhaps you watch the series, Who is God? Uh, with Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of God is, of course, the, the television series. And listen to what he says. God is the question you can't answer. Part of all of that is him saying, I am God. That would be a very Eastern understanding, or for many today, not a few in the West say the same thing, but it is largely an Eastern concept that God is everything. And so, I am God. Well, who or what is God? So you step back and get the big picture, and we really need to do that. Uh, there are some categorical questions that we need to try to answer. You might ask the question, why is there something instead of nothing? And when you try to answer that question, really you have, have three answers. Either there's, there's no God at all, so there's no purpose to the universe, and what exists is not by a mother nature or some kind of a cosmos with a capital C. Rather, it is pure chance, however it might be worked out with physics principles and all of that. So atheism, why is there something instead of nothing? Well, well, there is no God, and so, so something has always existed in eternity past, mm -hmm. and what exists today has come together finally by chance. A second category is pantheism, which means everything, pan, is God. So there are many forms of that in the world, but perhaps the most ancient, although it goes back in Greek philosophy as well, but is in Hinduism, particularly Advaita Vedanta Hinduism, that is non-dualistic. God is everything, and not all Hindus are pantheists by any means, but that is a, a classical view both in the East and in the West. And then there is theism. We'll come to that in a few minutes. Uh, theism is that there is a personal, infinite God who's created everything out of nothing. And so that has immense implications for who we are. We are created. God made us. And in Scripture, in his image, these are, these are fascinating. Let's step back for a minute and ask questions like these. Who or what is God? Well, you have to say is is the God you just described personal? What do you mean by that? It surely he doesn't have a body. He's God. Uh, or impersonal or apersonal, transcends any kind of a personal being. But out of this God flow, personal gods or goddesses or whatever. Is God finite or infinite? Uh most Christians would say, well, God is not finite, although some want to say, well, he can't help evil, or he's not altogether powerful, or he's not altogether good. But uh, is God 
finite or infinite? We'd say he's infinite, but would we say he's infinite in everything? Let me throw a curveball in here. You might say, well, of course he's infinite in everything. But the Hindu philosopher would say, no, no, your God has character. Your God is good and holy and just. If God is everything, then he's all opposites combined. He's good and evil. He's just and unjust, uh, and on from there. So we would say, well, our God is infinite in what he is. You might say what he, by his very nature and what he chooses out of that nature to be. Well, is God one? Is God three? Are there many gods? Or is God in all things? Again, like the pantheist, everything is finally God. Is God changeable? Or is God static? Is God, or is he evolving? Or is this God in process, as some want to say, evolving with the universe in time? Is God rational? Or is God irrational? You ever thought about that one? That could be an interesting one to discuss. But these are questions that frame big categories, aren't they? Aren't, uh, don't they? And so, again, is God good? Is God evil? Is God both? I know people who would say there's a dark side to God, that he created evil uh, as well as being good. Is God just? Is God merciful? And if he is really just, the absolute, the moral absolute of the universe, can he be merciful? Hmm. Uh, or is he just indifferent to all of this? And how do we have access to God? Is that through reason, as certainly many would say, Thomas Aquinas and others, at least we can have an idea of this God? Or is it through faith? A lot of people say, well, just believe, just have faith. But, but faith in what? Is it by illumination that suddenly we have, we have the lights come on and, and we have this profound sense of unity with God or one thing or another? Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the serpent had promised that she would be like God if she did that. Do we approach God by doing good or by rituals? Lots of rituals around the world, sacrifices and all kinds. Uh, not long ago, I was in a, a small, looked like a, 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 a court for, for a small game of soccer high up in the, in the, uh, the mountains of Guatemala. It was a Mayan temple area. And in that, uh, in that court, they played a game each year, team, one team against another. And whoever won the game had the privilege of being sacrificed to the gods. Now, they got a year of wine, women, and all the rest, or whatever they enjoyed in those days, but I would be a happy loser. Mm -hmm. uh, but imagine that, uh, people yearning to be sacrificed to the gods, the Aztec, of course, with tens of thousands of sacrifices. Some would say we come to God through icons, that as Jesus Christ became flesh, so God in, in, comes into our finite physical world and makes himself known. And so through icons, we can draw close to God. Or others would say through idols, that there is, when an idol is made, like in Egypt or in Mesopotamia, then they would have a blowing in the mouth ceremony. So the God would come into the physical structure. Maybe through drugs. And that was my generation. And uh, Pink Floyd and many others uh, getting beyond the wall, at least. And somehow drugs was that which illumined us. Others would say through trances. Perhaps you've seen the whirling dervishes of the Sufi vein of belief in Islam, going around and around and entering a trance to draw into the presence of God. So there are a lot of big questions to ask as we begin to define our God. And yet how one defines God will largely define our worldview. It's really true. If God is the absolute, the center of everything, then how we define God begins to structure how then we understand pretty much everything else. What is human? What gives humanity dignity? Why do we think? Why do we have emotions? Why do we have a personality at all? Is that just uh, uh, 
little bits of meat, as some are saying today? Uh, are we simply chemicals, as many atheists would try to affirm? So how one defines God will largely define one's worldview. Now, almost all Christians say they believe in God as Trinity. But what is Trinity? How would you define Trinity? As That's what this series is all about, of course. So how would you define the Trinity? Well, let me give you a basic definition as we, as we kick off. And that is this. The one true God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in nature, because it's one God, one substance of God, one essence, equal in glory, because it is a shared glory, yet distinct in relations. You might want to say that with me. Let's say it again. The one true God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in nature, equal in glory, finally, and distinct in relations. If nothing else, orthodoxy has always said that the Son is always the Son to the Father, eternally begotten, as many would argue, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father, and most would add, at least in the West, and from the Son, Spirit proceeding, yet distinct as a person as well. Well, so understanding who God is will define why you and I exist, who we are as persons. We're imago Dei. And how we, most, we may most be fulfilled individually and in relationship with others and even to the natural world and most of all to our Creator, which is, of course, the most important of everything. Well, it might be good to end our time with, with a creed that meant quite a lot to me. I mentioned that I was a, a doubter as, I, as a senior in a university, uh, reading John Milton's Tractate Against the Trinity, 70 pages of Greek and Hebrew, and I was looking for answers that I wasn't hearing from many. And uh, even I was a pastor after that, uh, briefly, an interim pastor in a church in Bellevue, Washington. And yet, nagging in my mind was that doubt of, is God really Trinity? I asked a number of people, and, and the ones I asked uh, didn't have very good answers. So I was struggling with that. As then uh, I moved to Switzerland, and I mentioned a man named Francis Schaeffer, who was something of a, an apostle to my generation. And though he didn't bring it up directly, another named Oz Guinness was there as well. And Oz said, well, go study it for yourself. And so I did began to get into the scriptures and finding one after another, and we're looking at some of those in our, our series, I realized, wow, God really is Trinity. The evidence is truly here in the scriptures. That's, that's beautiful. And then I came across this, the Athanasian Creed. And out in the Alps, uh, I wanted to stand up and, and scream, hallelujah, thank you, oh God. This puts it together so well. The Athanasian Creed was really a catechism for believers in the Latin church, the Western church. And follow along with me. Whosoever will be saved be all, before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Now, by Catholic, let me just put in, that, that means the universal faith that, that whether in Ethiopia or Egypt or in the Far East, wherever it might be, all who call themselves Christians affirm Trinity. So that's what Catholic means here. Before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which except everyone shall have kept whole and undefiled, without doubt he will perish eternally. Now, the Catholic faith is this. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty coeternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, and the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, and the Holy Spirit is infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. 
as also not three infinites nor three uncreateds, but one uncreated and one infinite. So likewise, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit God, and yet not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Spirit Lord, and yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by Christian truth to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there be three gods or three lords. That speaks well to Islam today, who accuses us of that. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. Notice now the distinctions. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. We'll explore that later. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and the Son, not made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, and one Holy Spirit, and not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, there is nothing before or after, nothing greater or less, but the whole three persons are co-eternal, together and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, who wills to be in a state of salvation, let him think thus of the Trinity. Well, we'll talk about whether people who don't believe in the Trinity are, are saved in the future, but none of us understood the Trinity, at least in any depth, when we came to Christ. So there's an attraction of the Holy Spirit that draws us more and more to the truth. It's those who keep renouncing, who keep fighting against, that uh, this creed speaks to. By the way, it was written in the late 5th century and used ever since. So we come back to the beginning in one sense as uh, Aslan welcomes Lucy. And Lucy says, Aslan, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one. He answered, not because you are. I am not but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. May that be the case for each of us. And again, that prayer of C.S. Lewis's uh, rings beautifully for me as well. May it be the real I who speak, and may it be the real thou that I speak to. Hey guys, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode on the Trinity. This is one episode in multiple episodes. You can go to our website and get two more episodes just like this completely free on us. If you'd like to buy the entire series, it costs $20, uh, but we've also released a series on the patristics and a series on apostolic Christianity. So if you want to buy all three of those series, it'll only cost you $40. We, we've dropped the price when you purchase all three to twenty or to $40 for all three of them, uh, or you can buy each of them individually for $20. Uh, now, now, that being said, if you're out there, I just really want to let you know, why do we do that? Well, uh, it spent us a lot of time uh, booking uh, the facility that we did to, to, to film this in. It took a lot of time and energy to get the lighting down, to get the cameras down, to do the recording, to do the editing, uh, uh, all of this marketing material to get out to uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, so, so it spent a lot of energy and time uh, along with all of our other shows that we're filming. This is just one of the ways that we've tried to figure out how to generate some revenue uh, for our ministry. So if you've been blessed by our ministry, please uh, man, support us by going over to the website and purchasing this series or maybe all three of the series. Now, that being said, if you're watching this video and you're like, hey, I don't have $20, I don't have $40, I get it. I've been there. Heck, I've been there recently. Okay, so if you want uh, a series like this to benefit you, we believe uh, these series are going to grow you closer to Christ. We believe it's going to teach you about the early church and doctrine that all Christians everywhere have always believed. So, so we want to give you this series. If you can't afford it, just go to the the website theremnantradio.com. Go to the contact section and go ahead and just send me an email. Okay, I'll give you the series completely free on us. Uh, you just let us know, and we we'd be glad to help you in this. So so I hope that you guys enjoy it. Everybody, whether you're going to buy this series, whether you can't buy this series, yeah, meet us over there at the website and we will continue this conversation. Blessings.